Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jay Kilroy. I am the chair of the Board of Trustees for Lakeview Academy. Um, I am joined tonight by a group that we refer to as the COVID Task Force that Dr. Kirsten Montgomery assembled uh, several months ago in order to deal with this uh, very fluid situation that we have in 2020. Um, R.K. Whitehead, former chairman of the board, is on the task force. Farrell Singleton, former um, head of school of Lakeview Academy for over 25 years. Scarlett Pendarvis, who is uh, the school's nurse. Obviously, Dr. Kirsty Montgomery. Sheetal Mangalot, who's also a medical professional. Um, Alan Tucker, from the assistant head of school from the business office. John Simpson, the assistant head of school. Um, and uh, we also have other members who uh, will be speaking tonight from the medical community that serve on a... a um, another part of the task force. <clears throat> we assembled this because we're in extraordinary times. And so the goal of this call tonight is to give you context and information about the policies and procedures that we have in place to ensure that the Lakeview community is as safe as possible for the entire school year. <clears throat> we're extremely proud of how we performed year to date. We have an exemplary record, actually, when you look at the data and you look at the numbers in terms of COVID cases as a percentage of the school's population, not only the students, but also the faculty. Um, and we recognize that we're in this time of extreme sort of contrast. We have people uh, that have views about this pandemic on one side and on the other. Our, our goal tonight is not to comment on those types of things. Our goal tonight is to inform you and to properly educate you about the policies and procedures that we have in place, to answer your questions, and to give you comfort that Lakeview is going to continue to be vigilant in the coming weeks and months to ensure a safe community for your child um, to make sure that we can remain open as long as possible because we think that's very important for the children. So with that, um, hopefully that sets the table and I'll turn it over to Dr. Kirsten Montgomery. Thank you, Jay. I'm just gonna share my screen now. Hopefully you can all see this in a second. Um, just give me one second, we'll start the PowerPoint, if I can. Actually, you know what, I'll leave it like that for now. Um, okay, just to uh, give you a, then a kind of quick idea of what we're gonna be covering. Um, we will be covering uh, a, a few minutes uh, on the learning and operations at the school, a little bit about how the task force was formed and the work that it continues to do on an ongoing basis. Um, There'll be a 10-minute uh, section given by our medical professionals on the task force um, that can speak really to what's going on now in the community. And then really the main part of this, uh, this webinar is to give you an opportunity to ask questions. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the webinar format on Zoom, um, you, you should have a, a panel. It'll either be at the top or the bottom of your screen and there should be um, a Q&A button there. Um, and you can actually type into the Q&A the questions that you want answered. So while you can see all of us on the screen and you'll be able to see the PowerPoint, you won't be actu actually be able to see each other, nor will you be able to mute or unmute yourself. So the way to ask the questions is to type them into the Q&A box and uh, I will uh, read out the questions and the task force can answer them uh, as we go along. Uh, as, as Jay um, already listed, this is the task force as it was uh, conceived um, back in June when we started working on how to safely open the school. Um, and just to give you an idea of what, what we do and what we have been doing, um, uh, we obviously, most of you on this call, I hope, uh, were aware that we, we the first line of operations was to create the back to school plan. And that was a way of us opening Lakeview for in-person uh, education um, in very challenging times. And so the bulk of the work of the task force was spent in the summer putting this document together, really thinking kind of creatively and safely about how we could do this, given the number of students that we have, the, the local population, the constituents, and also the, the constraints that all schools have in terms of um, budgetary constraints and space constraints, because those two things are very significant when dealing with um, a, a pandemic like this one. So that was the first um, order of things was to come up with this comprehensive plan that was a, 
a working document, but would also see us through really the whole school year and would be flexible enough for us to address any, um, any challenges that we faced um, in this very unpredictable time. Um, what we continue to do though on a, excuse me, on a regular basis though, we meet um, either weekly or bi-weekly as a team and uh, really catch up on kind of uh, what's been going on at the school, what some of the, uh, the challenges are that we face, what are some of the, um, the things that we can uh, change at the school based on new information that we've had either from the health professionals or from really the, the teachers themselves in putting in, in the plan into practice and seeing the realities of what we're actually trying to accomplish with, with real students, as opposed to obviously an exercise that was done on paper back in the summer. Um, we continue as a task force to monitor obviously national and local COVID updates and health updates and um, the health and safety uh, subcommittee will we'll speak to that. They are obviously have a, a kind of much more in, in touch with what's going on locally, which is again, very important to us as, as a school that we are paying attention to those trends. Um, the task force has also been instrumental in discussing where we can modify uh, some of our original assumptions about learning and operations. For example, we've, uh, we've recently um, enabled the fourth and fifth grade, the intermediate rooms to um, open up and allow them to move within their space a lot more freely than they were before. Um, we've also allowed the individual um, enrichment teachers in the lower school to be able to go in to their classrooms, whereas before um, they, 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 had, they had to move and the students had to stay put. So there's been some movement around which has made um, operations a lot easier. And this has also um, been done based on the, the zero cases that we've had in the lower and the middle school, which we're, we're very proud of those, um, those figures. There's other little things that we've been able to do. We realized, for example, um, for the uh, middle and upper school that share certain teachers, that has also put constraints because of trying to keep the, the two divisions separate. And we've made modifications um, so that the Spanish teacher, for example, can stay put in her classroom and the students can move safely through um, the, uh, from the upper school to the middle school. So these are all things that we've done uh, since actually writing uh, the plan. And um, the other thing that we do as a, as a team, as a task force is that we find ways of informing and keeping the Lakeview community informed of uh, what's going on. And that, that for us is the most important thing because um, none of this is any good if the community doesn't understand the challenges that we face and also has the information that they need um, to keep themselves safe. So we, we continue to find ways, whether it's through the website, whether it's through, um, you know, mailing updates or other forms of sharing this information uh, with the Lakeview community. Um, and this will continue really, obviously, until such times as we are no longer in this pandemic. Um, an example of this is that we, we discussed as a task force, putting our uh, information about our COVID cases online. And this is um, public information. There's, there's some schools that do this, some keep it uh, you know, behind the scenes on a, on a separate portal, but we felt that it was good information for the community to have. Uh, and we, we update this um, every single time there is a change. We don't wait a couple of days uh, before we make a change the minute that we have information that's relevant to the community, we update uh, that, uh, that chart. Um, another example, actually we can just want to show you some information to compare, um, for example, COVID cases, just to give you an idea um, of how we compare, say, to Gainesville City school system. So obviously they are a much larger school system and so they, they have uh, more cases. Um, but the percentage of enrolled students that have um, tested positive is, is actually the same for both uh, the, for the school district and for us. The difference though, and I think, I hope the, the medical team will speak to this, is that the number, the percentage of uh, quarantine students um, at Lakeview 
is low for the ones that were actually exposed at school. Um, the, and I got this data, obviously we have our own data. I got this data on uh, Georgia city school systems from their website, but it's almost 50 to 70% of their quarantines cases come from exposure within their school system. For us, it's the other way around, that the exposure comes out of school from family or other activities. And again, just to give you an idea of how we're doing with athletics, this has been, a, again, a big, uh, a big talking point for, uh, for many is, um, are, we, are we being overcautious or undercautious about the way that we're handling say, for example, seating capacity at games, um, our, our requirement to wear masks at games, and the social distance requirement. And we are, um, I think, really fairly and squarely in line with everybody else um, in terms of our uh, requirements to keep the athletes, um, the students, and the spectators safe. And this is particularly um, significant as we head into the winter months and obviously many of the activities are coming indoors um, where, where the, the spacing requirements are obviously much more stringent. So I'm just going to turn it over now um, to Mo and Jennifer and I can, I can move the slides as we go if you just uh, give me the nod. Sure, um, Dr. Montgomery, it may be helpful if you could actually display the slide too, just because there's a, sure, I'll, I'll, it helps to uh, do that. visualize. Hang on one second. Okay, how's so, that? Um, I'm uh, Mohuk or Mo the Bay. I'm an emergency physician uh, at Northeast Georgia Medical Center. Um, and I've had the privilege of working um, with Dr. Montgomery, with uh, Dr. Mangalot, um, Dr. Gotsman um, and um, Scarlett uh, on this uh, subcommittee. To, um, I'm not sure exactly what the exact title is, um, but we have been ma helping make the, uh, the decisions um, as it relates to some of the medical um, issues and even looking at quarantine decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I was asked today um, in conjunction with Dr. Gotsman just to kind of go over what, where we're at in the community um, in terms of COVID, um, its prevalence, um, you know, we, we, we had some data that just showed where we are from a school standpoint, but this is actually uh, data related to the um, local community. So this data is actually pulled directly from the Northeast Georgia Health System website um, and is updated on a daily basis. And this just shows the local percentage of positive cases only for facilities within the Northeast Georgia Health System. So these are, um, these are molecular or PCR based tests. Um, there are other tests that are available um, in the community um, so this is just indicative of, of what are the, the PCR tests in our um, area. And as you can see, there have been trends um, you know, going up and down here um, like a roller coaster. And we had started to see a decline. Um, fortunately, as you can see, even just when the school year started, uh, we had continued to see essentially a, a pretty significant downward trend. Um, and even just looking at a seven day rolling average, um, we're seeing um, that number actually get to pretty low levels earlier this month. And um, just in the last week, um, both, you know, um, I think we're seeing that um, in, in the emergency departments and also just from this data here and on state and national levels, we're starting to see another uptick um, in cases. Uh, so this is, you know, right now our, our moving average is around 7%. Um, it's been as high as in the 20s and 23% uh, if you look at uh, times uh, in the summer. Um, and then the 5% threshold is the number that the, the World Health Organization has recommended as far as the, the reopening when it's safe to reopen. So when we get numbers down close to 7%, I think we were all starting to feel fairly good about where we are um, as a community, um, Lakeview and beyond. Um, I think the concern right now is just the uptake. And I think Dr. Gotsman may be able to expound a little bit on the testing in her practice. Yeah, we have seen, we we mirror a lot of what um, Mo was saying. Um, we, in the last, actually yesterday, bad day, we had um, a 20 positivity rate. We had um, six positive tests out of 26 that were run. We have been averaging more about 10% for the last couple of weeks, and that's a significant, we are all, I think, a week or two ago felt better about things. 
but it's kind of what they predicted. We've seen an increase. Um, it continues to be with pediatrics. We we work like this subcommittee. We pull a lot of information through CHOA. We kind of have a meeting with Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. They have a meeting for practicing pediatricians every week or two, and they present data that's coming through their ERs, through their hospitals. So we're utilizing that in some of our information and decision-making. Um, the majority, you know, I think there are several take-home messages with kids. One, kids have pretty mild symptoms. Out of our patient population, roughly 40% of the kids who are positive don't have fever. Um, the majority of them don't have a lot of respiratory compromise, unlike what Mohawk sees in the ER. Um, what we see is typical kind of congestion, body aches, some sore throat. They look a lot like strep or like a sinusitis. And so, you know, testing helps us sort some of that out. The 50% of them will have the really profound sense of um, loss of sense of taste and smell, which is seen and mirrored, I think, in the adult population. But, um, you know, in general, it is not so much that the kids get that sick with it. It's what they bring home to their parents or their grandparents. And in the last couple of weeks, we have had several families that are affected multi-generation and have had several of them hospitalized, which is just a reminder that COVID is different in different in different folks. So um, just trying to think of what else. Um, I think as we, the one kind of take home thing as far as kids that I think is an important point for people to know is in August, the pediatric cardiologists kind of nationwide started looking at some of the myocarditis they were seeing in adults and they were seeing it mirrored in some of the college athletes that got sick during the summer and some of the high school athletes. And so there is a recommendation and it's on the um, algorithm that Scarlett put out. But if a we tell all our adolescents who are positive that if they have fever or if they have symptoms more than three days and they're athletes, that they actually, it is recommended for them to get an EKG before they return to play. And they can get that EKG at any point after that 10 day kind of stay home period. But that's because they're finding that their tests are preliminary, you know, studies are preliminary, but up to 15% of kids have a myocarditis or have some changes in their heart. Most of it resolves in time, but those kids can't go back to play until that normalizes. So pediatric cardiology from CHOA is dictating that. They're, it's lucky we have an office for them here in town. And so far, we have not had any, I've not had any kids that I've had to delay their play, but it is, that's one of the things as pediatricians, when we're seeing adolescents in particular, we're trying to make sure that that information is out there because that is one thing long term, longer term we need to monitor, so. Yeah, so um, Dr. Montgomery, if you wanna to go to the next, um, we can just, this just uh, again is from the G Georgia Department of Public Health um, website, just showing the intensity of COVID cases across the state. Um, as most of you are aware, Hall County uh, in this area was a hotspot um, for quite some time um, through, throughout uh, this. Cases have, have settled down to some degree, but still higher than other areas of the state. Um, and then you can keep moving. The other one, the next slide just shows the um, trend, uh, which matches what the, the first um, slide was, which is basically, this is state data from DPH from pulled from today, um, showing the yellow line is a seven day moving average. And the blue um, is just the number of cases per day. So again, correlates with what we're seeing um, locally in our clinics, um, in our emergency departments, and, you know, again, hopefully not in our schools, um, where we are seeing uh, an uptick in the number of cases. And the last um, piece wa here was basically, this is local data. So this is from the Northeast Georgia um, website, um, had the link at the bottom there, uh, pulled from earlier today. This is by age on the left, um, uh, the left side, the, the um, y-axis there is age, and then the x-axis is the total number of cases. Um, the blues uh, represent uh, basically the number of cases, uh, then teal is the number of hospitalizations, and then red, unfortunately, is uh, mortality. Um, as expected, uh, you know, the, the adolescents, um, basically all, all school age children have been able to manage this locally, um, for the most part, staying out of the hospital. Uh, but then, of course, uh, we have to worry about not just the students, but our staff. Um, and then we do see, um, obviously, upticks in hospitalization and severity of illness um, as people get older. 
Um, so I think that's pretty, pretty much um, just what we wanted to provide was just uh, kind of a high level of what the current state of COVID is in our community. Um, again, looking at how the number of total cases we've had in the school, um, I'm actually pleased um, that we've been able to get through um, you know, almost um, two full months. Uh, you know, just several, you know, two full months of of school uh -huh. thus far. Um, and appreciate everyone's um, cooperation, especially the students and staff with uh, with uh, you know conforming to the mask uh, policy. One thing that is important too, when we had to make decisions regarding quarantine, has been um, defining what close contact is. Um, and we really appreciate, especially our our, our teachers and our sports. Um, um, our coaches, et cetera, that have really helped us, um, you know, define um, when uh, there was a, a congregation of students and for how long, uh, because that does impact our decision um, in terms of um, who all needs to be quarantined. Great. Thank, thank, thank you both. Um, just before we get to the uh, Q&A, I just wanted to share this. This was actually in the uh, in the newsletter last week and the letter from the task force. But, um, you know, we, we certainly recognize how, how difficult these uh, kind of restrictions can be and really appreciate everything that everyone is doing. I mean, it's made a huge difference um, in our ability to, to operate. Um, but, but still some people have said, you know, what can they do to help? And these are the things that really um, all of you can do to help. Um, the, the COVID guidelines was a was an outline that uh, again was in the newsletter. It's also on the website and tells you kind of like uh, gives you a, a plan of you know what to do uh, if you have symptoms, whether to stay at home or not, and that kind of thing. And so we ask that you review those guidelines. Um, the the app, the daily screener, um, has has been actually far more uh, useful to us than we ever could have imagined, and we really really rely on that information uh, when we, we meet uh, most mornings, Scarlett, uh, John and I, to review what, uh, where we are with things. And um, there are still some uh, families who are not completing uh, the health attestation app. Um, and obviously we, we encourage that, that you do this every day. There's, there's uh, juniors and seniors are able to, to fill it in themselves and they are uh, perhaps a little less attentive to filling it in than others. And so we, we've also been asking them to make sure that this is, uh, this is done. The information is incredibly useful for us in our fight against uh, mitigating COVID. Um, obviously, uh, informing Scarlett if um, your child is um, exposed to suspected or confirmed case or, or anyone, your child or anyone else in the household has tested positive, or, or is being tested, sorry, for COVID. Um, that also, I'll give Scarlett an opportunity to just review that in a second, but this is also very important information and has, uh, the, the absence of that information has, uh, has hindered at times our, our ability to uh, address some of these issues. Um, practicing uh, social distancing, mask wearing and hand hygiene, not only in school, but also out of school. Um, again, very, very important that we're doing this um, all the time, because as I, as I showed earlier with the data that we have, that many of our cases really is not from transmission in school, it's from transmission outside of school. And then the final uh, plea is just to um, avoid sharing information. Uh, we've, we've had some instances of, of, of students sharing their information and test results and other things on social media. Um, before the school's actually been made aware of those uh, results. And um, again, that's just something, just for a multitude of reasons, that um, is best to uh, avoid uh, social media and share the information only with those who, who need to have that information. Um, I, I'm going to stop the share now and put everybody on the screen. And um, let's... Unless any, any members of the task force have anything to add to anything that's been said, um, I'll, I'll open it up now to questions. And as I say, if you're, if you're um, at home watching this, there's a Q&A button on the bottom of your screen, or it might be on the top, depending how you've got Zoom laid out. And if you just type your question into there and um, we, the task force will respond to the questions. I'm going to... Uh, 
uh, task force members, if you want to unmute yourselves, um, that would be uh, that would be great. Okay. So the the first question um, I've heard through my daughter and her friends that kids are not wearing their masks properly. Uh, while they're acknowledged that teachers are reminding kids they feel that there are issues with enforcement. Um, have you considered uh, implementing a demerit policy regarding COVID safety issues? Students may not realize the impact that their actions have on people and families, jobs that parents do. Perhaps Scarlett and John, would you, are you able to weigh in on that? And then I could probably weigh in too. Um. I can't speak to demerits or policy as far as um, that, but I, I can speak to the fact that for the most part, I've been incredibly impressed with the students. Um, sure, there are times that, you know, we've made some corrections, um, but for the most part, when uh, I am out and about, I see students wearing masks appropriately. Um, even the younger ones forgetting that they are able to take them off when distanced outside for specific mask breaks. Um, they just seem to have become part of their, you know, the younger, the younger ones are obviously uh, easier at adapting than, than the rest of us. So they've adapted to mask wearing very well. Um, I, I hear and see every day, you know, Mr. Simpson out uh, mask, mask up. And um, I have witnessed the distancing, um, you know, when they don't even know I'm there or th that I'm around the corner, I'll, I'll hear corrections from teachers uh, and administrators um, to, you know, to ask the students to please remember their distancing. Uh, in the lower school, especially the hand washing is, is impeccable and, and the, the cleaning. Um, I see that just because that's where my office is. Um, but, you know, those are some health practices that we school nurses have wanted for years. So um, I'm sorry it took pandemic, but it's fabulous to see so many little hands being washed so often. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that's what I have. I mean, I feel like um, there, are, there, there are going to be the occasional slip ups. There's going to be an occasional correction here or there. But for the most part, I would just say that I, I'm I'm overwhelmed by the and encouraged by the students, the faculty, and the staff, and their ad, how they've adhered to our policies um, with very little complaining. John, I think it's a, um, a great question. Uh, it's a constant reminder. Uh, never thought that we would have to look at um, this one for, for a pandemic. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a valid question, uh, something that we can discuss. Uh, but uh, for the most part, I think our children are doing the best they can do. Teachers are doing the best they can do. And we just have to, uh, in my opinion, we got to constantly remind, remind our, uh, our students, um, our community, and um, that, that we that we got to keep the mask up to, to protect each other, but uh, it's a great great question, and uh, we got to hold each other accountable each and every day. I would also just add really quickly that um, to date we have we have had no, um, and I knock on wood as I say this, but to date we have no concrete evidence that we've had any transmission from student to faculty or staff member. Um, we've also had no student to student known transmission, wow. confirmed transmission. We've had um, students who have a known contact outside of our school, and typically that's a friend or a parent. Um, so our mitigating strategies as of today have work, are working. Yeah, I would, I would just finally add, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, given the, the, enormity of what we were dealing with and the um you know every morning we're out there and before those kids get get out of their cars they're putting their masks on and if not you know we're, we're out there to remind them we give them masks if they the, very occasionally someone forgets um but but what we are asking of them is a lot you know we're asking them to sit through class after class with their masks on 
they do get mask breaks. Um, but, you know, I, I would agree with Scarlett that overall, the they deserve our, our praise for their efforts, as do the, the faculty and everyone else in the school community who's doing their part to make sure that we, we keep wearing the masks. Um, there's actually a couple of questions come in. Um, okay, this is probably for the health and safety team. How is it determined who is asked to remain home quarantine after a student test positive? Uh, my student told me that the student who sits immediately behind her in a class tested positive and was out of school, but I didn't get any notification of this, even though some other parents of students in the same class received notification. Um, Obviously, we're going to keep all names out of it, but um, who wants to, perhaps Mo, Jennifer, and Sheethal, do you want to weigh in on this? Scarlett? Well, I'll let the doctors speak to, um, but I, the, I can answer the question about the um, information home. I receive a class list from each division director um, if I need it, as to a positive student or a student that's been um, tested. And then I send out an email to each um, person that has a class with that student. So if for any reason you didn't get that information, please email me. I would like to cross-reference your student with the list that I have. It's possible that they you know, we have some class switching and probably not as much now as we did in the beginning. So if I didn't have an updated roster, then it's possible you didn't get the letter. And for that, I would totally apologize. But um, typically, I mean, not typically, but every time we have, each time we've had a student, every parent has received uh, a letter notifying them of that. As far as quarantining, um, I'll just let the the physicians on the team let you know um, how we're making those decisions. I mean, we're, we're following six feet uh, and aggregate exposure, not just one single exposure, but aggregate exposure of 15 minutes um, or more. Um, so, you know, again, if, if the student is within proximity, if they're less than six feet um, during that time um, and for an aggregate of more than 15 minutes, then that would be somebody that we, we um, are notifying or should be notifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for quarantine, what we ended up doing, because in part we use the masking as a way to, there are schools where, like for Mount, Mount Vernon, for example, like there recently was a positive fourth grader, they quarantined the entire class, regardless of the fact that they wear masks. So that whole class went home for 14 days. What we chose to do is to use a different approach where we kind of made it not that that we kind of most of the kids are spaced out so if they are greater than six feet and they have masks then we consider we may notify them when someone in their class position is positive but they usually exceed that six foot rule so they don't get included in a quarantine a kid who would be included in a quarantine would be obviously a sibling of a positive case because that's a close contact by definition you know if it is they've had you know, ridden like a carpool, that's another close contact. Or if they got together outside of school, we've kind of looked at, we know that before someone is positive or symptomatic, they can be transmit for we've kind of looked at a 48 to 72 hour window at the most, but we try to, and Scarlett does a great job of talking to teachers and coaches and figuring out, you know, what kids are at maybe at higher risk. And then we try to kind of put all of that, but really what drives every decision is, were they less than six feet for greater than 15 minutes? And it, they recently changed the recommendation to say not, it doesn't have to be 15 minutes all at one time. Or, and we consider those close contacts. And, you know, there's certainly, you know, the hard part is, is the ones that are quarantined, you know, that's a 14 day quarantine. That's because studies have shown, and I mean, I have a family I take care of, and there were all five of them got COVID um, from the time that the mom tested positive. She was the first positive to the time that the last child got it. He got, he was positive on the 12th day. 
her husband was positive on the ninth day. And that was after they didn't have any contact with mom after her positive test. He said they each one of her kids, well, two of them tested positive within the first couple of days. So she was half of them were living in the basement and half of them stayed upstairs until they all ultimately were positive. So we try to use that kind of information, but we really use the mask as a way to not have to quarantine as many, unlike some of the school public schools are doing. And I think that's why one of our numbers are so much less because we really have tried to be very selective about who we asked to quarantine versus who we notified just so people can know that they were in a classroom so that they can be, they're always attuned and looking for symptoms, but a little more attuned and know about the exposure. All right, uh, another one. Are we still giving our students mask breaks? This could help with mask fatigue. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I can weigh in with that. I don't know if Scarlett, John uh, have observations of the school, but I know, I know for a fact that they are all getting mask breaks um, at lunchtime as much as possible. We were very fortunate to have so many wonderful outdoor spaces at Lakeview, particularly the new athletics uh, stadium. And I know that the, uh, the older, older kids go out and eat lunch there, spaced out. There are dots on the, um, on the bleachers so that they're, they're social distance while they're eating. I know the younger kids um, are out for most of their breaks, perhaps not tomorrow and Thursday because of the incoming uh, hurricane, but um, other days they will certainly get um, get suitable breaks from wearing the mask because I know it's a lot for them to wear them um, all the time. Scarlett, do you have anything or John to add? Um, yes, yeah, so I get schedules just from the lower school for each class, um, K3 through, through five. And on every schedule are not only scheduled mask breaks, but then your, your regular break, which is sort of your playtime, um, playground time, and then, and, and then some outdoor PE time. And when they're not mixing um, classes for PE, they, and if they can maintain six feet and, and be outside, then they can break then too. So in the lower school, especially, there are, there are plenty of, of safe times for that. In the middle school, I'm seeing them utilize, like Kirsty said, the, um, the, the outdoor spaces. Lower school is too. Sometimes they just go out for a picnic. So um, our campus is just full of, on a beautiful day of, of kids of all ages utilizing every outdoor space that we can in order to give them that opportunity for fresh air, sunshine, and, and no mask for a bit. And I, I think tomorrow, being from a rainy country, I, I don't have any problem with them all going out tomorrow or Thursday either, but I, I realize that they, I may be overruled in that. So, um, you know, as far as mask break goes for middle school and, and upper school, uh, they, they have mask breaks at, uh, at break time. And, and then at lunchtime. And, uh, you know, I think that the question that was asked before, you know, are we making sure that they keep the mask up? You know, that uh, high school kids, they find their own my mask break every now and then. And so do middle school kids. But for the most part, um, you know, we're trying to keep everybody safe here. And uh, the mask is the, is the uh, best barrier that, that we have. And so, um, you know, we're, we're doing the best that we, we can do. And, um, you know, just uh, go date, try to enjoy today and uh, it's day to day operation. Okay. Um, so this is, we're hearing from colleague, from colleges that the plan to, for returning after Thanksgiving is still up in the air. Has Lakeview made any decisions regarding returning after Thanksgiving before the start of the second semester? Um, I can certainly answer that. Um, so there's no decision been made as of yet. I mean, obviously, the what's at stake here is that uh, the the holidays, uh, Thanksgiving break and uh, Christmas break as well. That that's an opportunity for families uh, to get together, and some some families from obviously distant places. And so there there is a, a perceived increase in risk in uh, ha having those breaks and then everybody returning back to school afterwards. So uh, we haven't made a final decision on that. I mean, our, we, we would like to keep school open. That was our stated goal right from the outset when we, uh, when we made the plan, even though we made it flexible enough. But obviously, 
uh, we, we will also be paying attention to the data and, and what's going on uh, in our own school. Um, you know, the numbers for us are not just about <coughs> the students, they're also about the faculty and the staff and keeping them safe. And obviously our ability to deliver education in person if um, operations are interrupted by having faculty or staff absences. But at the moment, um, we're, we're not, I'm not ready to make uh, a decision about Thanksgiving. Um, obviously it's um, a month away. And so if there's any decision to be made, it will be made within the next couple of weeks. Okay, I have a couple of other- And, and, and one, one second, Kirsty, I wanna clarify that. Um, we are not going to be making predictions about when we're going to, you know, when we're gonna be open, when, when we're going to close. We said at the onset of school back in August that there was the definition of success was maintaining a safe school environment and keeping school open, uh, ideally for the entire year. We're on a tremendous track to that right now. So a lot of times people try and ask us what we think is going to happen in three or four years, in three or four weeks, we are not in the prediction business. Yeah. We're taking it day by day and trying to be as safe as possible. So Thanksgiving is really a long time away, but we never have any sort of goal. Even if the community at large is seeing a significant increase, if we are controlling it at the at our specific school level, then we're going to continue on the pace that we're on. Yeah, my goal, my stated goal is to keep the school open every day this year. And I'd like to do everything we can to um, to keep uh, going with in-person lessons uh, until next, uh, next May. Okay, I have a question here actually. Um, why is it necessary to quarantine after exposure, close contact if the exposed person was wearing a mask? Perhaps the medical folks could weigh in on that one. You're saying to my knowledge, we haven't done that um, from a school perspective. If the close contact was outside of school, then I have asked about mask wearing and the answer has been no, that I wasn't wearing a mask when I was with that person. So as far as school goes, I have not, we have not quarantined, the team hasn't quarantined anyone that's uh, within the mitigating, well within mitigating factors, the masking, distancing and protecting. Okay. Um, the, the other questions come up about temperature screening, because I know we were, the week before last, we were doing uh, screening of the upper school students. Could you, do you want to speak a little bit about that, Scarlett, and, and what we found in, uh, when we did that? Sure. Um, so kind of um, in general, the consensus across the board with um, schools, school nurses, um, places of, of employment in our county, in our county um, stopped doing that in August. So um, what we, our findings last week, we did implement that after the fall break just to, uh, as an extra health measure, an extra mitigating measure, um, line of protection, just to kind of catch anyone just in case. Um, we did that Tuesday through Friday at every uh, entrance for high schools, uh, high schoolers. And we found, I had one that was actually my screener, on my screening that uh, was a, uh, a nine, uh, over a 99th, and then I had that person sit and acclimate for uh, 15 minutes and rechecked an oral temperature and it was normal. So we actually did four full days of that with the results being that nobody had any temperatures. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to do at all. Um, like Jennifer said, there's, you know, roughly 40, well, I think you said 40% don't have temperature. So just over half of the kids will have a temperature with COVID, but over, but half of them won't. And um, so it's not necessarily a tool that we have found to be very, as, as good as the questions on the screening app that are to be asked by you guys, by the parents every morning um, 
about symptoms. The symptoms seem to be more prevalent than the fever. The other symptoms seem to be more prevalent than the fever as far as catching this and sending, you know, sending someone home um, or to their primary care provider to see if that will, if they're sick enough to warrant a test. Great. There's one, one last comment question and that's about the, um, uh, the, the kind of stopping or, or reduction in the number of activities that we can do at the school as a result of COVID and balancing that with concerns about um, mental health. And um, I mean, I think and everyone in this task force would would agree that we, we every decision that we made, uh, we made and we continue to make is done uh, with with great thought and deliberation about the impact, not only on the uh, the students, um, their families, uh, the faculty, the staff, um, but also the you know, the learning experience, too, because we recognize these are extraordinary times. And we are trying to find um, opportunities to be creative so that everything isn't all about COVID, um, so that we can still have, um, particularly for those, um, you know, for the seniors who are, who this is their last year, um, opportunities for them to have, create special memories and do it safely and have some of the activities go on that uh, they would normally have. Um, this week, as you know, although, although of course the hurricanes got in the way of it, but um, uh, nothing I can do about that either. Uh, the, you know, we're having our play, um, the, the full play, which is being done outdoors. Um, and again, that's another example of the creativity of Lakeview staff who, uh, and students and faculty have come together and said, okay, we, we realize the restrictions of having, um, lo you know, large numbers of people indoors, but, but let's still do this. We don't have to cancel everything. Um, we, we did that for homecoming. We were able to pull that off safely. Um, we, we've done the same for uh, senior night. Um, we, we, had, um, we had senior games, uh, which was a very fun occasion. I think the budget for that, the school's budget was $10. And I think we spent uh, maybe $10.99 on an assortment of different oh. things that they could throw around the football field. But, but the point is, is that we, we are trying to um, still make these, uh, these moments and, and not be, uh, not be um, completely restrictive on what we are uh, enabling our, our, our kids to do. Um, there's, I think this time, we've actually got two more questions and then I think we should uh, probably call it a day. Um, is, there going, is there ongoing education to uh, uh, the upper school, uh, that what they do outside of school affects others? They are uh, having large uh, gatherings without masks, etc. Does anyone want to comment on that? I, I mean, I, I can certainly comment. I know that, um, I mean, we cannot, you know, as, as an organization, an institution, we, we can't mandate or get involved in what people do outside of the institution and, and nor, sh nor should we. Um, I mean, we, we can uh, obviously educate within the school and, and give the uh, students the information they need to understand the transmission of the virus and that the transmission of the virus is the same in school as it is out of school. And that uh, using uh, best practices, face, face masks, social distancing, hand washing and so on is, is good healthy practice in and out of school and that that will reduce the transmission of the disease. Um, I know that uh, the, the teachers I know have, have been sharing that information. I know that uh, Mike Lawley, the Dean of Students, uh, has that conversation with the students. Um, and obviously we, we send out information through uh, newsletters and other sources to, to provide the uh, students and families with the tools they need to make the best decisions um, possible. Kirsty, the last one is more of a comment versus a question. So yeah. let me uh, step in because uh, you, you and your team deserve a, an enormous round of thanks from the entire Lakeview community. As we said earlier, when we started this year, our goal was to remain open for the entire year. And one of the benefits of the Lakeview smaller school environment is the ability to spread out to maintain small class size 
and to provide a safer environment for everyone. And here we are two and a, roughly two and a half months in from the start of school. And it's just been an exceptional school year thus far. So a big thank you to yourself, Scarlett, uh, John Simpson, Alan Tucker, and the entire Lakeview team who've worked incredibly hard to disinfect, distance, and, re and you know, respect all the things that you set out. Um, and just the overall Lakeview community for respecting the environment that we're in, regardless of what your views are on masks or on vigilance and that sort of thing. We've all banded together and it's made for a very successful year thus far. Um, so we'll, we'll have another one of these probably as we approach Thanksgiving, if we, but uh, just to clarify, because, you know, we got, I got a couple of text messages on this while we were on this call, we are going to remain open as long as the Lakeview Academy community is safe, regardless of what's going on at colleges elsewhere. And even in the broader community, if the Lakeview Academy community is safe, we're going to remain open. And that's just the advantage that we have as a re result of the smaller school that we operate. So hopefully this, this format was helpful for everyone, but again, a big thank you to, Dr. Montgomery and her entire team for, uh, for making it a very safe place for all of our kids in the community this year. I would like to support what Jay said and congratulations as an outsider. Uh, the cooperation that I've seen with the entire uh, Lakeview community is outstanding and congratulations, Dr. Montgomery. And we'll keep our finger crossed for the upcoming weeks. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, and I'd also obviously like to extend thanks to the team here. Uh, none, of this, uh, none of these decisions are made in isolation. We work as a team and uh, er everyone has been instrumental in making, uh, making these, uh, uh, th this process uh, possible. And obviously thanks to all of you and your, and your students uh, for all your support in getting through this uh, challenging time. I know we'll get through it and I know that brighter days are ahead. So um, uh, please feel free if you have any further questions, you can either email me or Scarlett, or if you have a question for a specific team member, uh, we can certainly pass that along. And, and, and thank you very much for uh, joining us and uh, hope you have a good evening.